So now that we have explained psychoanalysis and behaviorism, it's important for us to talk about the third wave of psychology. And this third wave was important because unlike the psychoanalysts who believed in no free will because of the unconscious and behaviorists who believed in no free will uh, because of pre-existing uh, conditioning, humanism, the third wave, believed in all that gooey peace, love, happiness, and free choice. So let's get into it. So humanism was really started in the 1950s and reached a bit of a peak in the 1960s, and it's often called the third wave in psychology. It often really hinges on the idea that we have control in our fate. Through becoming aware of what's in your unconscious or aware of you've been conditioned of in the past, you can do something about it. It's also important to note that we are designed to be good. And so you'll see here my imagery relates to peace, love, and happiness, and it very much is that more hippie, free love type of flavor of psychology. Some of the major names in humanistic psychology at the outset uh, include Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers believed uh, that all people are designed uh, and driven towards love. We're hardwired for love. Uh, and that this love could also be known not just as romantic love or familial love, but as positive regard. And positive regard could include things such as a smile, a uh, warm face, um, and appreciation for another human. This does overlap a bit with what behaviorists described as a reward. You could reward a person with attention. But Carl Rogers believed we're hardwired desiring this. And we can receive this positive regard or love in unconditional settings or in conditional settings. In a conditional setting, this is the idea that we only get positive regard if we meet certain conditions. And this could be if you clean up your room, your parents will thank you. If you do well at school, your teachers will like you. If you do certain things, you'll be accepted by your friends. And when you're looking for conditional positive regard, we tend to change and shape ourselves into what will get that positive regard. Rogers believed this was problematic. With only receiving conditional love, you can never really be true to yourself. You'd be a fake self. You're doing the things that are going to make you accepted by others and not what you truly want to be. So if you truly want to be an artist, but your parents want you to go into business, you're going to shape yourself into being a business person, even if that will never make you happy. It's because you're driving after this other thing you think will make you happy, known as positive regard. Rogers believes that better is when we get unconditional positive regard. And this is when parents love you regardless of what you want to be, regardless of what happens. This is when a romantic partner or a friend or a mentor gives you positive attention regardless of the mistakes you make. This allows you to not follow these external cues, but rather to respond with the internal cues of being true to yourself. This is the idea that it can allow you to be self-actualized. Now, Rogers was also a therapist, and so like psychoanalysis and like behaviorism, there is a therapy uh, that corresponds with humanistic psychology. And this Rogerian therapy, also known as person-centered or client-centered or humanistic therapy, uh, looked around letting the client, not the patient, but the client, being true to themselves. So how do you do this? In psychoanalysts, uh, the, the therapist very much interprets the dreams for the patient. But in client-centered therapy, there was no interpretation and no directives given. The goal was just to be the mirror and mirror back so that the client could be true to themselves. This included really focusing in on the client, making sure you're blocking out all external distractions, being present in the moment with them, being authentic and real with them, and active listening. By active listening, this is the idea that when they said something, you would mirror back what they said, but rather than doing follow-up questions or telling them what they should do, you just keep mirroring back. Rogers believed that if we had a supportive listener in our life, we could all solve our own problems. He believed that even in the throes of a massive mental health crisis, if someone just had a safe, supportive person who listened with love, that people could make the right decisions for themselves. Now, this is not without criticism, but this impacted all future forms of therapy to come. It led to a lot of therapists becoming a lot less authoritarian over their patients and a lot more willing to throw, form a partnership with their patients. It is criticized because in many cases, people don't have the coping skills or the right things were not modeled to them in the first place, so they need to learn through someone who had more positive experiences. 
Another big name in humanistic psychology is that of Abraham Maslow. So like Carl Rogers, he also talked about self-actualization and finding these peak experiences of yourself. Maslow wrote at length about this, including his hierarchy of needs. He believed at the bottom of the hierarchy were our physiological and safety needs. Are you fed? Are you well rested? Are you somewhere safe and secure and protected from the elements? After that, it was our social and self-esteem needs. Do you feel like you belong to others? Do you receive love from others? Do you fit in? Do you feel good about yourself emotionally or are you down on yourself? Once you feel like you belong and you have good self-esteem, then Maslow believed we could reach what were known as peak experiences. The peak experiences were also called self-actualization or self-transcendence. And these were moments of clarity when everything made sense in life, when you felt, yes, I'm on the right path, life is beautiful, this all makes sense. This could happen at major lifetime outcomes, uh, such as at a marriage or birth of a baby or graduation. This could happen in nature when looking at the ocean or at a mountain peak or in the forest. This could happen when a job uh, was successful or when you get hired or when you retire, but it could also just happen in a sunny morning while cleaning your kitchen. And so he believes some people were able to reach these peak experiences more readily than others. And that some of us, because of some obstacles and barriers in our life, we have a harder time reaching it, but that we may occasionally have a peak experience. Now, it needs to be noted that this theory was heavily borrowed from uh, an indigenous community. In particularly, uh, right here in Alberta, Canada, uh, the Sioux and Blackfoot Nation uh, were uh, connected to this theory. So Cindy Blackstock, a major Canadian Indigenous researcher, uh, found that Maslow's theory of hierarchy was very similar uh, to uh, the Blackfoot Nation's idea, uh, but it's a bit it's a bit flipped. So the Western perspective really put um, our, our physical needs at the bottom and then this self transcendence at the top, versus the First Nations perspective looked at self actualization self actualization as the basis. The idea that until you have your own stuff together, then you can't take after the community, take care of the community. That everybody in the community needs to be at peace and find the self-actualization for themselves. And only when that happened, can there this be a community level actualization? And once we have that, then we can have cultural uh, perpetuity where everybody's kind of getting long and people, the society is flourishing. So rather than just looking at this as a selfish gain, we could look at this as a communal gain very important uh, uh, root of this theory. Now, that was humanism in the 1960s, but in the 1990s, that brought about a reharkening or a bringing back of positive psychology. So positive psychology really started with Martin Siegelman, and Martin Siegelman was originally looking at things like learned helplessness and depression, and then in a turnabout began to study things like happiness and creativity and what predicts happiness in life. The idea of positive psychology, it spun out from humanist psychology, but it's broader. Instead of just looking at self-actualization and love, positive psychology studies more things. Uh, instead of looking at what's gonna predict depression, why, why are we always looking at the bad side of life? Why are we always predicting mental illness? Why not let's predict people that are going to flourish and people that are going to do well? And so he wanted to look at what is predictive of happiness, who is happy? Even looking at things like people that were paraplegic or people that were homeless, some people in those communities could experience high levels of happiness and what led them to do so. He also examined things like creativity. How does the mind work to make connections and create something new? One of his students, Angela Duckworth, went on to have a very, um, uh, very notable career looking at grit, persistence, and perseverance. The idea of effort. It's not just talent that matters, but it's the effort you put into things. And that this grit or stick with it attitude that you don't give up when you start struggling. You push through and push through. And that this is actually very predictive of wonderful life outcomes. Uh, there on, they were on more of the east coast of the U.S. On the west coast of the U.S. Uh, is Dasher Kellner uh, at Berkeley, who studies things like embarrassment and kindness. The idea that because as humans we have this emotion called embarrassment, it means we're not just all psychopaths. Embarrassment is the idea that you are conscious of what others think of you, and you're self-conscious of it. 
And the idea that our species has evolved to have these self-conscious emotions means our species is hardwired to consider other people. And the fact that we're hardwired to consider other people is a good thing. It means that we're going to be more kind to one another. It means we're going to be more considerate. And it means that on a whole, humanity is capable of lots of beautiful things. So that's humanism and positivism, uh, ranging from the 1950s to the early 2000s. Uh, and that's really talking about our feelings. But what about our thoughts? The next area we're going to talk about is cognitive psychology.